Joshua chapter 1. We're going to do things a little bit different this morning. Uh, Brother Eugene, can you turn off the pulpit lights and the chandelier lights? We're going to do a little presentation this morning. Isn't that exciting? Everybody go, ooh. <laughs> ah. Okay. We'll work on it. Amen. <laughs> we'll work on the ooh and the ah. Um, I asked the pastor if he's all right with it. I'm going to take a break this Sunday and next Sunday from 1 Samuel. And uh, I want to, I was asked back in to, back in the June or July when I went down to Tennessee to speak on Satan's devices. And I, I told him, I said, well, I can come up with a presentation for it with pictures because people like pictures. And uh, they said, yeah, we'd love that. So I go down there and I, I talk with the, the sound guy. I talk with their, his right-hand man. I never talked to his pastor. That's why you should <laughs> That's why you should always go through the pastor, amen, that's a good example of it. I talked to the right-hand man that scheduled me to come in and said it's okay, he wants the pastor wants me to come in. I talked to their sound man, I made sure they had a, a projector. We didn't have a projector, Grace and I didn't. And uh, they said, yeah, we got one, I checked, made sure it was the hookups and everything. And I get down there and uh, the pastor says, we don't have a projector. And I go, why not? And he goes, well, I gave it to our missionary out of our church, he's presenting a Brother Honor Alf church this evening. So I ended up doing this whole presentation without any of the pictures or anything, and uh, so that was interesting. Went well, they want me to come back, but um, the uh, I'm going again in December to speak on it. Uh, a man over in Marietta, Ohio, wants me to come and speak on it. Again, wants me to do the presentation. He thinks it'll help his church. Um, I'm doing it for you all, number one, as a guinea pig. Amen. <laughs> I love my guinea pigs. Uh, I want to know what goes, I don't know, hold on. I want to know myself what goes well and what doesn't go well. You, you don't have to give me feedback, but I know that some of you, bless your hearts, are going to give me feedback once I'm done, tell me something like this. I couldn't see it. I didn't read it. You're going too fast. You're going too slow. It was too bright. It wasn't bright enough. The images weren't big enough. They are too big. You don't have to do all that. I'll take that in on my own. And then I'll, I won't do it. And then that way, so you're all my guinea pigs, number one. Number two, I think it'll help you. Uh, I really do believe it'll help you. What I'm covering in the PowerPoint is different than what is in the um, than what's in the book. How many of you have read the book? Amen. Don't lie to me. my book, Satan's Devices. Yeah. <laughs> have you read it, Emma? Yeah. Ryan? I have. You have? Okay, I know I like you better than Elmshead. Mike took it. All right. Yeah. Did he? Yeah. Uh, but what? What I'm covering in this presentation is not really in the book. Some of it is, and um, but some of it isn't. The reason why I did it this way is I wanted, whenever someone gets my book, to still be able to get something from the presentation. And if they listen to the presentation, I want them to still buy the book. There's different material in this that's not covered in the book. And also there are pictures, and uh, we know we all love pictures, amen? Let's see if we can get it to work. How about that? Wouldn't that be wonderful? Mm-hmm. Um, there's Joshua 1 9. Why don't you work more, buddy? You're just on there. there. <laughs> Someone read Joshua 1 8 for me out loud. Joshua 1 8. Someone read it for me. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. But thou shalt meditate therein day and night, thou shalt, or that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Thou shalt have good success. Thank you. you were just working for it before. There he goes. Praise the Lord. He said, meditate therein. You've all heard that verse preached on. Meditate therein day and night. Meditate. Now turn over to Psalms chapter number 1. Psalms chapter number 1. Psalms chapter number 1. You've all heard this preached on, taught on many a time. Psalms chapter number 1. Psalm, Psalm chapter number 1, it says, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. Verse 3, 
And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly are not so. The ungodly are not like the righteous, the man that meditates in the word of God, but are like the chafe which the wind driveth away. They're blown away. They're burned up. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we love you. Thank you, God, just for this morning, Lord. I pray, God, for these next few minutes, Lord, you'd help us. Uh, Lord, uh, just help the technology to work and everything. Lord, help my mind to be clear to teach. And God, I pray, Lord, that it would build up our faith in the Word of God. Uh, Lord, uh, a lot of this will be science. Uh, Lord, secular science, but Lord, uh, you are a God of science. You created science, Lord, and there's science who falsely called, uh, Lord, that teaches us to deny you. Um, but God, we know, Lord, that's just fake science. Lord, it's not real. It's just lies made up, Father. And, uh, we know science is usually behind the Bible. And uh, Lord, uh, we want to be up, Lord, with the times. And God, uh, just show us something out of your book, Lord, that will help us increase our faith. Lord, I ask and pray in Jesus Christ's name and amen. Amen. I want to expound on Joshua 1.8. But I'm going to use Psalms 1, uh, verses 1 through 3 as kind of a springboard. And uh, I have that quote in there. Not all readers are leaders, but all leaders are readers. Amen. You ought to read books. Uh, and uh, I know a really good book. Amen. Satan the Divine says you ought to read it. Uh, but uh, not all readers are leaders, but all leaders are readers. If you want to influence people, you got to read. Um, you you got to influence people. you got to put something up here. Uh, your mind is a toolbox. And you'll never go to work with an empty toolbox. Otherwise, you won't get any work done. A lot of people try to live their life with an empty toolbox. You say, Brother Aaron, I'm just a simple, oh, I'm just an old, simple man, an old, simple woman. You're looking at a boy right here that was raised in Georgia, born in Georgia, raised in southern Ohio on Goat Mountain. If anybody knows what the term hillbilly, or redneck means, it's me. Amen? I don't like ignorance, though. I don't like people that glory in ignorance. Uh, we are losing a generation of Christians because of the... Uh, their fathers and grandfathers and grandmothers think, you do it because I said so. They, don't, they aren't raised in the same mindset that you are. The new generation that's coming up, they have a wealth of knowledge that's available to them with a click of a button. So what they do is, when you tell them to do something, what they're thinking is, why? What is that going to benefit me? What does research say about it? They're thinking, what do my teachers tell me at school? What do the science books tell me? What does this tell me? What does that tell me? To just say, just believe it because I said so, that, that, first off, that's not the Bible. God often explains himself. Not always, but he often does. And uh, so my point is this. You ought to try to read. You ought to try to uh, grow mentally. And you ought, to, you ought to try to grow intellectually. You ought to, it says that Jesus Christ grew in wisdom. Wisdom. The first thing he grew in was wisdom. What does that mean? Intellectually. He grew intellectually. The first, you know the first people Jesus Christ was talking to? Doctors and lawyers. Inside of a temple. He's discussing law. Sorry, amen, amen. I like that stuff. I mean, amen. That's good preaching. This is teaching, amen. But you ought to try to, you ought to try to grow intellectually. What I want to look at this morning, we probably won't get to the other points here, uh, points three and four, but I do want to look at this morning, what physiological effects does screen time have on my brain? And number two, what are the greatest practical impacts of screen time on my life? Uh, screen time, meaning time you spend looking at a screen, uh, time you spend on your cell phones, on, on laptops, and again, I'm not condemning them, I use them every day. I have a smartphone in my pocket right here. I'm using a laptop. My wife has a smartphone. I have a tablet. Uh, we both have laptops at home. I work on a computer all day long. I'm not saying you can't use them. Uh, I'm saying not let them use you. And then there's a difference. Uh, there's a difference. Uh, so what physiological effects, what physical effects does it have on your literal, literal brain? We're not going to be that spiritual this morning, amen? Y'all ought to say amen to that. This is going to be science. There's no spirituality in it. We'll get to the spiritual stuff maybe at the end or maybe next week. Um, in your Bible, the word mind, or a form of it, minds, minded, mindful, minding, your mind, comes up 132 times. Uh, think, or thinking, or thinketh, think s, thinking, 79 times. Meditate, 14, we just read two verses of meditate. Meditation shows up six times. Thought, or thoughts, or thoughtest, 134 times. God obviously cares about what you think about. Like I said, God's not an ignorant God. Uh, one of the greatest facts in your Bible, or greatest truths that you'll never be able to understand, is over there in Genesis where it says, the Lord thought in his heart, or the Lord thought. It says that, the Lord thought. You realize that you can know what God is thinking inside of his heart and mind? But God's interested in your thoughts and my thoughts and what we're thinking on. He's interested on our brains and what goes on on our brains. 
Uh, we read these verses, uh, meditate, the definition of meditate is to contemplate, to think, to dwell on anything in thought. Um, mindfulness, the mindfulness uh, def definition. How many of you have heard of mindfulness? Anybody heard of mindfulness? You've heard of it? Anybody else heard of mindfulness? Yeah. Uh, mindfulness is something that's coming up big right now in um, mental health, and not just mental health, but athletes are using it. And, um, the idea is you're thinking about what you're thinking about. You're aware of your thought life. I've said this to you before, but how many times have you gone by uh, thinking about something and five, ten minutes goes by and you're sitting there and you go, whoa, what was I thinking of? What, what, what was I doing for the last five or ten minutes? Your, your mind was thinking, but you weren't aware of what it was even thinking about. You're literally wasting time, wasting thoughts. And uh, some of you are saying, hey, I'm wasting thoughts this morning. Hey, man, I don't know where my mind is right now. That's the definition, though, of mindfulness. Um, Meditation and mindfulness go hand in hand, is what I want you to understand. Meditation and mindfulness. They go hand in hand. Whenever Jesus Christ, or whenever, not Jesus Christ, whenever uh, the Lord said, meditate therein, he's saying be mindful. Mindful of your thoughts. Mindful of the Bible. Mindful of what you're thinking about the Bible. So they go hand in hand. When you meditate on God's word, it will make you like a tree. See this tree over here? It doesn't have any leaves on it. Um, you'll be planted. You'll be fruitful. Um, right up here's the definition of... This is a neuron. There's different parts of the neuron. You have the nucleus there of the DNA. You have the axon, which is this long uh, portion right here. This is where the message is sent um, from one neuron to another. When the neurons are the cells in your brain and your central nervous system, they go throughout your body, your neurons do. There are more of them compacted inside of your brain. They get longer as you go down the body. The neurons actually get longer, uh, but there are, I have the numbers on them. I'll show, tell you in a minute. Uh, you have the axon terminal, which is just the end. Um, it forms junctions with other cells. So the other cells come and they hook up to that neuron right there. Uh, don't worry about any of this. This is an electrical impulse is sent from here, there. I guess it would be from here, there, actually. Um, you, and up here, the other important thing is the dendrites. Uh, what you have is you have other neurons up here connecting to these dendrites. They release neurotransmitters, which are listed over there. Acetylcholine, dopamine, glutamate, serotonin, norepinephrine, uh, GABA. You can't see the bottom one. It's G-A-B-A, -A, GABA. And uh, you don't write those down. Those are just the most popular neurotransmitters or the most studied. Uh, you have 86 billion neurons in your brain. You have, uh, I forget how many. Where's the connections that's coming up? Uh, you have trillions of connections in your brain. So I'll show you this. Well, I'll show you now. There could be another neuron coming, connecting to this one, sending a message to it, and there could be another few hundred or few thousand neurons connecting to this one. So that's why you have trillions of connections in your brain. Um, you have 86 billion neurons, but you have trillions of connections because they can have multiple connections with different neurons. So uh, it receives the neurotransmitters, it receives one of these, it goes down here, it makes an electrical <laughs> signal, an impulse or a pulse, and it goes down here to the end, and it connects to another neuron, or multiple neurons. And it's a pathway. Does everybody get that? It's a pathway. Your brain's full of pathways. Whenever you think of something, that thought up here, it says, I'm thinking of it, I'm thinking of it. It sends a signal to another neuron that says, think of this, think of this. Uh, whenever you're thinking of, you look at a word, the first thing you do is you identify that's white, that's black lines on a white background. Those are letters. I've learned that those are letters. I was taught that. But you don't remember learning it, but at some point you learn those are letters. And then you know those letters have, think about this, you do this all instantaneously. This is all just in a split second. Within a split second, this is how amazing your brain is. It says black lines on white paper, those are letters. Letters have meanings, letters are symbols. If the line is going this way with another line going through it, that's a T. A T has a sound, it can be tough. Whenever you combine that T with a TH, that's an H there with a little hump. That's T, 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 T. The, that the and you make words. You're sending your neurons are sending signals to each other, saying that's what all that is. they're communicating. A pathway, and your brain does that within a split second, um, less than a second. And it's sending pathways back and forth to each other. Uh, acetylcholine is just a chemical that has to do with uh, atten attention. It's also in your muscles. Dopamine is called the pleasure chemical. So uh, food, drugs, sex. It's the most studied. Dopamine is because people are interested in it. Um, uh, glutamate is an excitatory neuron. Glutamate, uh, so it, it excites other neurons. Uh, too much glutamate, too much of a positive thing, can cause stroke or traumatic, traumatic brain injury. GABA is an inhibitory 
You know, glutamate's excitatory. GABA down here, gamma amino butyric acid is the long name for it. But GABA, GABA is negative. It inhibits. I'm jumping ahead of myself, but God's a balanced God. You have positive neurons in your brain that are excitatory, and you have negative neurons in your brain that are inhibitory. Uh, GABA and glutamate work together, and believe it or not, they play a major role in learning. Uh, having positive, that negative uh, in, uh, inhibition uh, plays a role in uh, learning. Serotonin is called a calming chemical. It affects your mood, your appetite, your sleep. Uh, serotonin does. Uh, norepinephrine is a, uh, it has a lot to do with arousal, um, response to stress. So whenever you're uh, stressed out, nor uh, norepinephrine is going to kick in and tell your body you know, to wake up, deal with the stress. Um, so those are some of the neurotransmitters that are in your brain. Have I lost anybody yet? <laughs> Let me say this. Not if you're confused or not. Um, are you learning anything? Did y'all learn something? Okay. You learned this in school already? I didn't learn this until I got to college. Uh, but anyway, this is the thing. Um, 86 billion neurons uh, throughout your body. 125 trillion synapses just up here. Your cerebral cortex is just up here. You still have your brain stem. You have your spinal cord. And you have uh, neural pathways that go all the way out to your fingertips. Nerves that go all the way out to, and to your feet, to your toes. Um, you have 125 trillion um, synapses. This is a picture of a neuron. This is a picture of a tree. Look a little similar, don't they? Um, you know something I've noticed about builders and project designs and everything, and artists? You can usually tell an artist's work because it looks a lot like the rest of their works. Uh, you can usually tell a man's work, he's a carpenter, you can tell that it's probably his work because you look at the other works that he has and they're similar. They have a common designer. You know why a tree stripped down with its roots and its branches up here looks a lot like a neuron? It has a common designer. The same one that made the trees outside and made the neurons in here. A cognitive neuroscientist, uh, I was talking to him about the Lord in his office, and he's talking about how he just he can't understand. He said, I can see science. He said, I can't see God. And I said, first off, you can't always see science. I said, you need to use a microscope a lot of times to see it. God sometimes can be hard to find. You, you got to look at uh, sometimes uh, adamantly for him. But I said, uh, he goes, see, he goes, the trees. He said, I can see the trees. He said, I can understand photosynthesis. He said, I can understand uh, the cycle of trees and how they live. And how they, that's what he used to talk, to deny God. He used trees. He said, when I look out and I see trees, he said, that's science to me. He said, I can understand. It. He said, I can't see God. And I told him this. I said, Dr. Petro, I said, the difference between you and I is where you see the trees, you say, I can't see God. Whenever I see the trees, I see God. And I talked to him about, oh, I'm going to tell you about neurons and trees and how they look similar. And uh, let me see here. These are just some pictures of neurons. Uh, so you can see up here, look at all those different connections that they have. That's that axon. Uh, there's a the cell body. Um, the, uh, the terminal down here connecting, intertwining. That's your brain. I mean, that's a pretty complex, isn't it? Um, here's just some more pictures. They uh, just highlighted the cells there, that, or the, uh, yeah, the, uh, the nucleus. Same thing over here, they, uh, the nucleus, you can see, you can see the different synapses going to different neurons, so it's a complex system. Uh, there's no computer like your brain, in my brain. This is just a side note. Um, have you all ever wondered what your body, or not your body, I hope not your body, but what someone's body looks like in hell? Over in Psalm 22, 6, you know, turn there, Jesus Christ became a worm. He said, I am a worm. Despised of men. Y'all remember that? He said, I'm a worm. Yeah. Isaiah 14, 9 talks about where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Turn over to Isaiah uh, 14, actually. Turn over there. I think it looks like a worm, don't it? Yeah. This yeah. right here. If you were to, you have right here, you have your cervical, spinal column, the vertebrae, the bones right there. You have your cervical, thoracic, uh, lumbar, and then sacral. You see how it's curved like that? Your and I, if you were to strip down our flesh, we'd be curved like that. Um, the central nervous system, I'll get to it in a second. Isaiah 14, if you're there, say amen. Amen. Uh, that's, down, that's how I say amen down south. Amen. Uh, looking at me like, what in the world? Isaiah 14, verse 9. Hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. It stirreth up the dead for thee, even all the chief ones of the earth. It hath raised up. Uh, from their thrones, all the kings of the nation, all they that 
shall speak and say unto thee, Art thou also to come as we? He's talking about Satan being cast down. He's talking about hell's move for thee, the chief ones from the earth, and hath raised up from their throne the king of the nations. And they shall, are, are going to speak unto Satan and say, Art thou also become weak as we? Art thou become <coughs> like unto us? Thy pomp, remember Satan, Lucifer, have a lot of glory, and he was, he's king of the he's prince of the power of the air right now. Thy pomp was brought down to the grave, and the noise of thy vials, the worm is spread under thee, and the worms cover thee. The worms cover thee. Um, Mark 9, you don't have to turn there. Remember where Jesus Christ said, uh, where the worm dieth not, the fire is not quenched. Yep. Where the worm dieth not, the fire is not quenched. He says it multiple times. The worm dieth not. Jesus Christ became sin for us. He said, I am a worm. I am a worm. Became sin. Uh, you need a new body to be able to last in hell. I don't believe, personally, that your new body is going to look like it does now. I believe you're going to look like a worm. He said the worms turn over. They, they're over thee. Um, your central nervous system, this isn't a great representation of it. It includes your eyes and your mouth. This is a. This is your central nervous system. They, di they dissected it. And they took away all the muscles, all the bones, all the cartilage, all the flesh. And it looks like this. Isn't that kind of creepy? Yeah. I mean, they didn't teach you this. Did you learn this in Ryan in school? No, okay. Uh, I'm going to be one of the craziest science teachers you've ever met. Amen. Uh, but this is what, so you got nerves that go all the way down to your hands. Uh, you have nerves that go down to your feet. Um, how many of you have heard of uh, phantom limb pain? Phantom limb pain. Uh, we work with a, a lot of people. Uh, we work with some people that uh, they had below the knee amputations due to diabetes or cirrhosis of the liver or something. And uh, they maybe get their leg cut off below the knee. And they talk about how weird it was. Sometimes they'd go to get dressed and they would feel their foot extending into their pants leg, even though their foot isn't there. Mm. And sometimes they get a cramp in their foot that doesn't exist, and it hurts. It's painful. Um, what it is, you can cut right here, and if a surgeon is not careful and cuts that the wrong way, it can cause a lot of damage, and you'll have constant shooting pain. Uh, but what it is, is even though you cut right there, that uh, the connection up to your brain you still have neurons that are going up to your brain that represent the foot. So even though you cut it right there, you have, it's called phantom limb pain. It's phantom, it's not there. You still have the pain of your foot, and you feel the pain of your foot, even though your foot's not there, because the nerve, the connections are still there. Even though they cut off from uh, below the foot. It's cool. It's interesting what they do. It's called mirror therapy. It is snow outside. It's beautiful. Don't look, thank God we ain't got windows. Y'all wouldn't pay attention. Um, but uh, I'm getting distracted. Amen. I'm like a dog when it sees a squirrel outside, just takes off running. Um, but anyways, uh, what was I talking about? Mirror therapy. That's what I was talking Phantom. about. Yeah. You can take somebody, say they got their hand cut off, or say that they have arthritis, severe arthritis. You can also do it for severe arthritis, and they can't move this wrist very well, or they have surgery on their wrist, they can't move this one very well, or they just have it completely cut off, and they have phantom limb pain. So they feel like their hand is cramped and stuck in a, in a position. And they can't get it out, and it hurts them. What we do is you can set up a mirror right here, and it blocks. And that mirror is looking this way. And with this hand, their good hand, we'll tell them, all right, you feel like your, your, fist is, your fist is clenched in a painful position. That's how they feel. Put your other hand in the same position. All right, now look at the mirror and open up your hand. And that limb that's not there... It tricks the brain to think that you're releasing the hand from the cramped position. And it relieves the pain. It's called mirror therapy. You use the good hand, you hide the hand that's amputated or the hand that can't move very well, and you begin uh, moving that, that other hand, and we'll have new exercises with it to stretch it out. And it looks like that hand is moving, and your brain is tricked, and it relieves the pain from it. It's called phantom limb pain. Interesting stuff, I know. Um, isn't it? Is it not? Um, you still have, uh, so in hell, you'll still have your central nervous system and your peripheral nervous system. Your central nervous system is your brain, uh, brain stem, and your spinal cord. Uh, so just this right here and right here, as well as your um, your eyes, your taste. Right there is this, you still have, you're, you're still going to have taste. Uh, you're still going to have your visual system and, and see that uh, in hell. You'll have your gustatory system. You'll be able to taste in hell. Uh, that's part of your central nervous system. So your taste, your, all your senses, taste, touch, sight, smell. And your peripheral nervous system, so down here is a sense. Um, if I touch your arm, that's your peripheral nervous system. You can feel that I'm touching you. Um, so you'll still have those senses in hell. 
Uh, so you'll be able, still be able to see here, uh, smell and taste. Um, what else do I have on this? Uh, oh, we're going to get to where I thought we were. This, isn't, this is the best drawing I could find on the Lake of Fire. Uh, I don't really like it because I don't think there's going to be mountains. And I also don't believe you're going to look like a skeleton in hell. Um, I believe it's going to look like what I showed you. I believe there's going to be a bunch of these or these rolling around in hell like a bunch of worms. I think the Bible literal. When it says worms, I believe it's going to look like worms. I don't believe he's talking figuratively or allegorically or anything like that. I believe there's worms in hell. And you become a worm. You become a worm. I believe you're going to have all your senses. And this is how you'll have them. You don't need your fingers to be able to feel your fingers. That's what I was getting at with phantom limb pain. You don't need toes and feet to feel your toes and feet. You just need the body of a worm. I believe that's what it's going to look like. I believe in the lake of fire. That's what people, that'll be worms rolling over each other. Now, you say, well, Aaron, how uh, nerve pain, how many of y'all have had nerve pain or have nerve pain this morning, amen, the whole congregation? Uh, nerve pain often feels like a shooting, stabbing, or burning sensation, don't it? Oh, man, it's like burning and stabbing and pulses almost. It hurts. Uh, ain't it funny that the Bible says there will be gnashing of teeth, stabbing pain? Yeah. On you. On a person in hell, they're going to feel a stabbing oh, pain, hmm. burning, lake of fire, fire and brimstone. It's not just going to be the fire that's hurting. It's going to be a, the, ner the nerve pain is going to increase. It. The nerves will be burning. I believe there will be actual fire there. The pastor talked about that, about the salt, sulfuric fire that you won't be able to see. Um, by the way, Evan Ryan, I don't think you guys are here for that. Have you ever wondered in hell how there's fire but no light? Isn't it kind of weird to think of? There's going to be a fire. I never thought of it until I was 27. He mentioned it in, I think, Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, there's a, the, a Bunsen burner in your chem lab. I don't know if you have those. The Bunsen burners, uh, there's fire that you can't see. It's sulfuric fire. Um, it's fire that you can't see. So in hell, there can be fire, but no light. Sulfuric fire. And it has to do with, um, that's how it works. I, did, I never thought of that. We brought up in a Wednesday night Bible study in Genesis. So that's how, that's how, there, that's how there could be eternal darkness. Bible people that reject hell say, "How can it be eternal darkness yet have fire?" Yeah, but it can't. It can be a fire that you can't see. Yeah. Um, so and that I don't have to go over that with y'all. Um, turn over. This is kind of interesting. Turn over to Isaiah. You're in Isaiah already. Turn over to Isaiah 65. This is just a side note. Amen. Uh, you're saying, "What the world does that have to do with the brain?" Well, I'm teaching you about the brain, spinal cord. I'm trying to incorporate some of the Bible in it to increase your faith in the Bible. Um, the Bible is literal. I hate when people say it allegorically. It means you'll be a worm, so you'll be you know, rejected. And, no, it's come out literally, you'll be a worm. Um, Isaiah 65, look in verse 17. Isaiah 65, verse 17. For behold, I create, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered, nor come to mind. It's interesting. God's interested in your mind even during the millennium or uh, the, new, the new Jerusalem where he creates new heavens and a new earth. Isaiah 65, verse 17. 65, verse 17. He says, you shall not, they shall not be remembered, the former things, but, ye, but be glad, amen, you ought to be glad that you cannot forget some things, and rejoice forever in that which I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing, and her people a joy. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem, and the joy of my people. And the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her, nor the voice of crying. You say, why are there no more weeping or crying? Well, he's going to do away with your memory of the past. Now turn over to Isaiah 66. And I'm just going to be honest with you. i got to study it out more. I don't know if Isaiah 66 jumps back to the millennial reign and what we just read in Isaiah 65 is after the millennium. I, I don't know. But I know this. During the millennial reign, there's going to be feast that we're going to come to and worship. Um, you and I, we're going to, like the Jews did, we're going to have feasts that we go and worship the Lord at certain times of the year. But I believe throughout eternity... I believe we're all going to go off in eternity. Some of us are going to have different planets that we're in charge of. Some of us are going to have cities on those planets. We're not going to have a full planet. We, have, we may have cities. Uh, some people may be doing this and that. Depending on what you do for the Lord, he's going to bless us. And his kingdom is going to keep growing out to eternity. Um, so you're going to be in control of different planets if you serve the Lord and work for him. But I believe that we're still going to come back to a centralized location, probably New Jerusalem, and still worship at certain times. We're all going to come back. Now, look at this feast. That we're going to come to and what we're going to do on the way to the feast. And again, I don't know if this is during the millennium or after the millennial reign. Like we just come through eternity. The lake of fire. We know where hell is right now. It's in the middle of the earth. The lake of fire, scholars aren't real sure where it's located. 
They don't know if God just rolls it all up, says that uh, hell were cast, the death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. They don't know if the lake of fire is just going to burn out there in a, in a black mass or, or what it is, but the location of it. So I don't know. Some people believe that the lake of fire is going to be here on earth during the millennium. That you're going to be able literally to walk by and see a lake of fire, people burning in it during the millennium. Uh, some people do believe that. I think that might be true. And then in eternity, he cast death and hell into the lake of fire. So I don't know, but look, but read this here in verse number 20. They, it's talking about Gentiles, and they, it's the last word of verse 19 says the Gentiles, and they shall bring all your brethren for an offering unto the Lord out of all nations, all nations, upon horses and in chariots and in litters and upon mules, and upon swift beasts to my holy mountain Jerusalem, saith the Lord, as the children of Israel bring an offering in a clean vessel into the house of the Lord. So he's saying that they're going to be bringing it with the children of Israel, the Gentiles are. They're going to be bringing a, a sacrifice. I will also take of them for priests and for Levites, saith the Lord, um, for as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before thee, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. He's given Israel promises here. And he's saying, I'm going to give the Gentiles, they're going to get in on the worship, um, but your name's going to remain the same, your seed's going to remain, the promises I've given you are going to remain. It shall come to about pass, verse 23, from one new moon to another, and from one Sabbath to another, shall all flesh, all flesh, we're all going to come to worship before me, saith the Lord. Uh, and they, verse 24, shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me, for their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall all and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. An abhorring unto all flesh. I think that you and I are going to walk by the lake of fire either in eternity or during the millennium, and we're going to look down here at a bunch of worms. And the former things are not remembered. You say, how can I look down in the lake of fire and not weep and cry, knowing that my loved one's down there? Because you're not going to remember them. They're not going to look the same. But think of this. They're going to have all their cognitive functions, and they're going to be able to see you and remember you. We're going to go by the lake of fire, and we're going to go to worship before the Lord, and we're going to stop on, on the king's highway, where I said the lake of fire is close by the king's highway, and we're going to look off. And just see this. And the former things are not remembered. We're not going to know them, but they're going to be looking up, writhing around like worms, screaming out, crying out, looking at us. Um, and they're going to know us. Amen. The Bible's something, ain't it? It's more than just thou shalt not, amen. Well, then on a happier note, amen, that's kind of dark, wasn't it? Praise the Lord. Y'all said, I've never had a science lesson that was so depressing. <laughs> but anyway, we'll end on this, and then uh, we'll pick it up next week. Uh, effects of meditation or mindfulness. So mindfulness, again, uh, occupational therapists can practice mindfulness. You just have to get some training on it. Um, and you can do this with people that are dealing with stress, depression, anxiety, PTSD, um, chronic pain, um, a lot of different things. You can uh, work with people on this. Uh, mindfulness, they found in research, mindfulness, meditating on your thoughts, I'll give you a quick example of it. Uh, mindfulness is just something like this. Uh, I would talk to the person. They'd be sitting. You can do it different ways. I, you could have them sitting there, and you just tell them, um, you know, close your eyes. And they close their eyes, and then I'd say, okay, I want you to just try it. Whenever you breathe, I want you to just think about your breath. And I just want you to picture your breath going into your nose, and down your esophagus, and into your lungs. You feel your lungs expanding. All right, now push that air back out. Good. Okay, I want you to think of the seat that you're sitting on. I want you to feel that seat beneath you. And then you go down there, you go, you go down their legs, I want you to feel the ground beneath you. And what you are, you're being mindful of your body. Uh, you, you talk about their thoughts. I want you to you start talking about what thoughts they're having and things like that. And you say, Aaron, that sounds like you know, psychiatry or something. So, so, it, it is a little bit, but um, it works. They found out that it, doing that, and they say to do it even throughout the work day. Take five minutes to do it, just... Be mindful of what you're thinking, how you feel. Are you tight in your shoulders? How many of you right now are tight in your shoulders? Let your shoulders down. I just seen some of you relax your shoulders. Some of you were sitting like this. Amen. Uh, but mindfulness, and you're aware of your body, your thoughts. It can decrease anxiety. It can decrease symptoms of depression. It can improve your emotional regulation and insight. It can improve your immune system. It can improve your empathy for others. It can increase integration. Uh, you carry over things that you've learned. It produces neurobiological changes in neural pathways. It's called neuroplasticity, which we'll cover next week. 
Decrease of anxiety, I, I just summarized it. You handle stress better. When you're mindful, you can handle stress better. Decrease symptoms of depression, make you happier. When you're aware of your thoughts and what's going on inside your body, you're happier overall. Emotional regulation and insight, you can control your emotions better. Improve immune system functioning, you'll be healthier. You'll be healthier. Digest food better, you'll think better. Uh, you can breathe better. You'll care about others. Empathy is caring for others. We have something that's called prayer. Uh, mindful of others. You can care. Integration means you'll carry over things that you've learned. That you'll learn better. It produces neuro, it'll, uh, neurobiological changes in, uh, in neural pathways. You can physically change your brain. Physically, you can change your brain. And we'll get into it next week. Something called neuroplasticity. It's the way that your brain, your brain literally changes. It doesn't look the same throughout your life. The pathways don't look the same. And it's all brought about, the changes in your brain and the pathways are brought about by how you think. And whenever you change the way that you think, you change the physical makeup of your brain. Mindfulness. Mindfulness. We'll talk about some more next week. Any questions real quick?